All right, well, thank you all so much for joining us for Gender Equality and the Carter Administration presented by the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library. We're going to explore the state of women's rights issues in the 1970s, the Equal Rights Amendment of 1972, and the constitutional means the Carter administration embraced to address gender inequality. The discussion will be guided by relevant primary sources of the National Archives and the Carter Library, with opportunities for attendees to weigh in with their perspectives. And as I said, this program is led by Joshua Montanari, who's the education specialist at the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library. Uh, so all 50 of us or so, and I think that number will uh, you know, continue to rise a bit, uh, and the 100 or so that will watch on demand, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Joshua for joining us here this afternoon. And Joshua, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Robert. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get my screen shared. Just bear with me a moment. Okay. So as Robert says, I uh, am Joshua Montanari. I'm the education specialist at the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library and Museum uh, down here in Atlanta, Georgia. And today our program is Women for a Change, Gender Equality, and the Carter Administration. So this is a program that I've typically given to high school students, but I think it's also great for a general audience uh, like yourselves. So we'll go ahead and get into it here. So today we'll be talking about uh, Carter's 1976 campaign. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, what he's doing to address gender equality after he's in office, uh, a little bit about the topic of the Equal Rights Amendment, which comes to the forefront during Carter's uh, time in the White House. And then we will uh, kind of close out with the 1980 uh, presidential campaign when Carter's now running on a record, not what he plan plans to do. Um, and we've got a great primary source there along with our uh, program overview there, President Carter signing legislation uh, pertaining to the Equal Rights Amendment, extending the deadline. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but I am um, an employee of the National Archives and Records Administration um, at the Presidential Library where I work. So our bread and butter is encouraging the general public to come and access the primary sources uh, that belong to them, because uh, everything in our collection is property of the American people. Uh, but just a reminder at home, when you are looking through primary sources like the ones we'll pre be presenting here, um, we want to think about the parts of the document, making sense of it, what historical evidence do they pr provide. Usually that historical evidence is answering a how or why question. That's really the meat of when you're looking at a primary source. Uh, and something to remember about a good primary source that you never have all the answers you're looking for. If it does, it's probably a secondary source. So a primary source should prompt some further inquiry, uh, put you in another direction, or at least provide you one of multiple perspectives. Uh, so National Archives does provide these uh, document analysis sheets if there's anyone doing homeschooling or anyone just wants a, a little bit of training wheel, so to speak, in their uh, historical research. It's a great uh, resource to take advantage of. You can find them on the National Archives website uh, under their education tab. So we'll start off with a question, and if you're so inclined, feel free to uh, type a response in the chat, and Robert can relay those um, to me so that I know, because I'm not able to see the chat right now. But here we have a photograph of the first design for the Great Seal of the United States. This is from 1782. Uh, now, we know this uh, does change a little bit before it gets to the final version we have today, but something that remained the same is that Latin phrase we see in the eagle's mouth, e pluribus unum, out of many one. So if anybody can think of, how is that guided? If you can think of an example in our nation's history, how is it guided political, social, uh, or economic change over the time? You know, maybe just take a minute to absorb that out of many one. Think about what that means to you. That's what being a historian is all about, is seeing what something means to you, not just uh, buying into what some, someone else's conclusion or opinion about something is. But out of many, one. Think about that political, social, economic. I mean, one thing that comes to my mind is maybe patents. When we think about economic, 
and one American can patent something and then that's there for the rest of the country to take advantage of and apply to their lives for better or for worse. <laughs> Any other, uh, we're getting so, anything uh, in the chat? Yeah, not so much an answer, but a comment okay. from Patricia. I think the authors wrote for inspiration, but sadly they didn't actually live up to this. Uh, Martha, uh, when she hears uh, that phrase, um, she thinks of uh, perhaps the civil rights movement. Uh, Terry notes that individuals can depend on our one country for help. Okay, and those are great multiple perspectives and I think all valid. Again, these are what you think. It's not some prescribed answer that we're looking for here. Uh, yeah, I think maybe uh, we haven't lived up to that in some cases or we've maybe painfully or begrudgingly lived up to that, depending on the topic that we're talking about. So that's just something to get the gears going, what we're thinking about here, because I do think it applies to our topic because we are talking about gender equality and have the many people in our nation of uh, different gender identities. Do we somehow come together at, with an American consensus uh, uh, on what equality means? So again, we're uh, looking at the 1976 campaign. There we see Jimmy Carter and Walter Mondale, all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. I think if you go to the same uh, kind of poster motif in 1980, they look a little more, <laughs> a little more tired, maybe a little under the weather after what they had been through in the previous four years. But we'll start actually with the Ford administration to see what where we were at the time that Jimmy Carter decides to throw his hat in the ring. Uh, for the presidency. So in the previous administration, uh, women were accounting for 12% of appointees in the government. Uh, there was a female cabinet secretary, Carla Hills of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, Gerald Ford was an open supporter of the Equal Rights Amendment, seeking to put equality in writing in our constitution. Uh, see, so he approves the Equal Credit Opportunity Act of 1974. And, you know, I think a statistic we'll bring up a little bit later maybe lends a success to that. Again, what we're talking about there, again, going back to a different time definitely is when women could not apply for credit, whether that's a loan, a credit card without a male co-signer. Let that sink in if we have any young people in our audience by chance today. Uh, you had to have a man co-sign with you to get a credit card or open a line of credit, get a loan, get a mortgage, any, anything um, of that nature. Uh, so that's a kind of a big step forward there. I think that really affected uh, half the country. I think we can agree on. Uh, and then something as a gesture, he does sign a proclamation on Women's Equality Day in 1974. Uh, but again, drawing our attention to the primary source here, I think that old adage kind of rings true, a picture's worth a thousand words. And here's uh, Ford with his National Security Council. Um, this is, I believe, with the fall of Saigon in 1975. Um, and we do not see any women in that room, despite maybe Ford's best effort at representation in the government. I think that picture kind of gives us an idea of where the status quo is at that time when we consider gender equality in government. In terms of the campaign, this was a very unique campaign in that the incumbent Gerald Ford uh, was running for election as he had been a congressman from Michigan when Richard Nixon is elected to the White House with Spiro Agnew as his vice president. Uh, Agnew gets in a little hot water with his taxes, resigns the vice presidency. Gerald Ford from Michigan, a congressman, is appointed vice president. Uh, Nixon, uh, believing he is about to be impeached, resigns. We then have the first president in U.S. history, uh, neither elected president or vice president. But I think these two um, uh, primary sources here, well, campaign button, campaign poster, really show the contrast uh, between the Ford campaigns and the Carter campaigns in 1976. We see Ford there um, you know, taking on the persona of Fonzie, <laughs> Fordsy. Uh, maybe appealing to that happy days crowd, beckoning back to the 1950s, maybe the way things, as many folks perceive what they were, the good old days, happy days are here again. Jimmy Carter, on the other hand, is 
I guess going a, uh, a little more uh, pop culture. Uh, you know, he does get uh, called by Rolling Stone magazine, the rock and roll president. Um, he would introduce himself oftentimes as this, you see that advertisement on the right there, um, on stage at Allman's brother, Allman Brothers concerts. Um, he was also really close friends, uh, people like Willie Nelson. Um, he quotes Bob Dylan in his inauguration speech uh, in, 19, in, in 1977. So we, we definitely do see a, a difference here between the tones of these campaigns, maybe one looking back and one a little bit uh, could be characterized as progressive. And when we look at the results of that election, Jimmy Carter gets 52% of both male and female voters. So naturally, Ford gets 48% of those. So we do see equal percentages in each campaign as far as uh, their support. Um, Jimmy Carter's electoral college victory, not a, what, anything near what we would call a landslide, 297 to 240, relatively close. Uh, but women do comprise more than 52% of the total voter turnout. So we do have more women right now at this election, this point in history, participating in our democracy than men. And something many historians would uh, attribute to uh, the controversy of Watergate, a lot of people losing um, faith and credibility in the government. Um, and then this last statistic, it seems a little confusing at first, but you know, if you just follow me here, more people voted in 1976, so the total number of people voting was more than any other previous election. However, voter registration was also at a high. And so when we consider overall voter turnout, again, kind of lending some credence to the impact of Watergate, voter turnout is down 10% uh, if, if we go back to 1964. So we do see a downward trend of overall participant, uh, participation in democracy, but we do see an increase in women participating. So maybe they are gonna, are gonna have a little bit more uh, to say in a Carter administration. So we'll talk about now Jimmy Carter taking the oath of office as we see happening in the photograph to the left on January 20th, 1977. Uh, quotes both his high school principal and Bob Dylan in his inaugural speech. Nice balance there. So it's good to get um, a constitutional foundation. And so what when we look at constitutional solutions that were available to President Carter, naturally, uh, these are the constitutional uh, solutions available to any president of the United States. Uh, and these are the basics. Congressional legislation covered in Article 1, Section 1, uh, which is subject to approval or veto by the president. So Carter would have a role in any legislation that's passed by Congress. Naturally, he's free to try to influence um, any of that legislation that's in the works. Uh, executive action, something very broad, uh, which is loosely defined in Article 2, Section 1, is powers not relegated to other branches nor explicitly denied to the executive. Uh, and then uh, one I think a lot of presidents take advantage of to kind of show their uh, uh, support, whether it's for gender equality, diversity, um, any number of various stakeholders in our country, presidential appointments. Article two, section two, talking about ambassadors, public ministers, consuls. Um, also, I believe there talks about the president uh, also accepting those of other nations although I don't have that listed there. So these are basically the nuts and bolts of what any uh, chief executive of our country has at their disposal to address really any issue, not just gender equality. So we're gonna start with basically some executive action. Again, this is something a president can do more or less unilaterally, uh, does not need the approval of Congress. Um, not something that really takes the place of legislation, though, so to speak. Uh, so this is just one example here. Carter creates a task force on women business owners. Again, recalling that Ford had passed that Fair Credit Opportunity Act. So now we have many more women um, at the helm of businesses, begin starting those businesses because they now can legally do it independently and on their own. Uh, he does begin appointing uh, prominent women in business to his administration, like Juanita Krebs, we'll talk about her in a little bit. Uh, I think at that point she had been a CEO of IBM. 
uh, the number of businesses owned by women rises from 1.9 million in 1977 to 2.5 million in 1980s. That's a one third increase, 33%. Uh, percent. So that's a very tangible uh, statistic and record right there that we see. And I, again, I think that's something we can attribute to co to the Ford and the Carter administration together with actions that they uh, both took. So we have a primary source here, again, illustrating what we're talk talking about, Jimmy Carter addressing uh, the task force on women business owners. I do have a link here uh, with Carter's four remarks on that day. And again, I'll provide a PDF of this slide presentation to Robert that he can distribute to everyone because I do highly encourage folks uh, to do a little more uh, independent investigation and inquiry, uh, which we just don't have time for in our slot today. But that's something I highly encourage you uh, to check out on your own time. So again, building on the work of the previous administration, Carter expands membership of the National Commission on the, Observ on the Observance of International Women's Year uh, from 35 to 45, so 10 more members added to that, and again, an executive order, uh, not something taking the place of legislation. Uh, then when it expires, he does something that's very typical of most presidential administrations. If there's a popular um, program, um, task force, what have you, and it's a uh, um, and its congressional statute expires, you typically they renew it and give it a slight change in its name. So um, for a lot of us, maybe it slips by and they can claim it as their own <laughs> new original thing that they've done. So I think Carter maybe does a little bit of that political maneuvering here. Uh, he basically renews that task force, but now calls it the Advisory Committee of the International Women's Year, uh, but more or less same committee. And we see that committee uh, meeting here in this primary source uh, at the White House, Carter there at the table. Uh, we can see uh, Abella Abzug to his right, also renowned um, uh, leader in the women's rights movement, who's a part of that task force. So here we can uh, see a actual uh, language why that executive order was just issued. The Interdepartmental Task Force is designed to promote equality, for American women by ensuring that the needs of women are recognized and incorporated into federal policies and programs. So really it's an advisory capacity. Uh, has up to 30 members um, and a big, it really has uh, a liaison here, Sarah Weddington, Carter uh, points her. Uh, we see her photograph on the White House news document there. And there's a lot of these in the Carter Library Collection. If you're ever looking to do uh, deeper research, you can go to our website, jimmycarterlibrary.gov, uh, complete our Ask an Archivist form under our research tab, and get some more information on this topic. But we have a whole lot of these, although to be taken a, a, with a grain of salt, these are being put out by the Carter administration, might be relative bias there. So I would also recommend balancing it with other perspectives and other primary sources. So this is really how the White House is communicating uh, their efforts uh, to address gender equality. And Sarah Weddington's really the White House face of that, the liaison to the American people. Some other notable appointees, uh, Midge Costanza, assistant to the president for public liaison, a uh, big advocate for women's rights. She was also a big advocate for LGBTQ rights or gay rights as they were known at that time. Uh, and full uh, disclosure, that actually got her in some hot water in the Carter administration. Uh, they were, at that time, I think, were trying to get women's rights not to be a fringe issue, to get it, get them gender equality to be accepted as a, uh, a mainstream idea in society. And I think when Mitch Costanza was really being outspoken for LGBTQ rights at the same time, I think the Carter administration uh, saw that as detrimental to their goal of getting women's rights um, commonly accepted at that time. I, you know, maybe history has vindicated Mitch. Uh, Juanita Krebs, as I mentioned, had been CEO of IBM. She is the first uh, woman appointed to be Secretary of Commerce, and I believe the fourth in U.S. history to be appointed to a cabinet altogether. Uh, and then also there is Patricia Roberts Harris. We see her portrait uh, painting there. She was Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, also Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare before uh, 
reorganization. Uh, you may know that Carter um, reorganizes the government a little bit, something he, had, he was known for doing as governor of Georgia. He establishes the Department of Education, uh, but she is the first woman to serve in two uh, cabinet capacities. She's also the first woman to be in line of succession to the presidency. So I think that's something worth noting. So we do see some representational strides being made in the Carter administration. Uh, but probably no other area is impacted more than judiciary appointments in the Carter administration. Uh, when we think of diversity, I believe the Carter administration appoints uh, more women and people of color to the federal judiciary branch than all previous 38 administrations combined. So let that statistic sink in. More people of color and women than all previous 38, going all the way back to the Washington <laughs> administration. That, that's quite, quite a uh, record, I think, to run on in the promotion of diversity. Uh, but again, we can see primary source on the left there. Again, White House uh, News on Women document. As I mentioned, we have a lot of these in our collections. Uh, communicating what Carter is doing in terms of the federal judiciary, showing all of the different women he's recommended uh, that he's supporting there. And in the photograph on the right, we see a very notable appointee of his. Uh, Jimmy Carter does appoint Ruth Bader Ginsburg as a federal judge, not as Supreme Court justice at the time, but this would be seen by many to propel her into the national spotlight to eventually be nominated by uh, later President uh, Bill Clinton, and she is then confirmed. Um, so that's something that we see the ripples of. So maybe all of these changes don't happen within the Carter administration, but it does set the stage for it to happen later down the road. So he's definitely making an impact um, with the powers of the presidency, that power to appoint provided for in the Constitution. Uh, the 1977 National Women's Conference uh, was a, a really big deal at that point. Uh, a lot of people's radars there, supported by multiple first ladies. We can see in the photograph there, Rosalind Carter, Betty Ford, uh, Lady Bird Johnson. Um, Maya Angelou is there. Uh, when we look at this photograph at the microphone, there's Abella Abzug, who we saw in that photograph with Carter with the Women's Task Force meeting at the White House. Uh, and this really, they kind of come together to really create a, women, a women's declaration, um, which is read aloud by Maya Angelou and the spirit of Houston, more or less, you could say outlining um, where they collectively saw women's rights at that point in time and going into the future, really laying out the blueprint uh, for what they expect, uh, expected to come. Also see that torch, uh, they, they held a torch, torch relay uh, from Seneca Falls, New York, to Houston where this was happening. So kind of in the uh, vein of the Olympic torch carrying the raise uh, awareness of the, wherever they went along that route. So getting back to constitutional means, we can legislate change if Congress passes a law and the president agrees with it, signs it. One of those uh, that Carter does sign is the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. So again, having to transport ourselves back to a different time, much like Ford signing that uh, Fair Credit Opportunity Act, at this point in history, before the signing of this law, if you are a woman and you become pregnant, that is grounds for dismissal. It's not automatic, but any uh, supervisor, boss can invoke that uh, because it is just uh, assumed by society at large that if you are pregnant, that obviously is your one and only priority to be a mother, to be a caregiver uh, for your child. Uh, you cannot do that if you are working a job, whether that be part-time uh, or full-time. Uh, so it is not until 1978 that Jimmy Carter uh, puts an end to that discrimination. Um, and basically the way they work this through Congress is it is an amendment to an existing piece of legislation, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And so no longer would the uh, folks we see in this picture have to fear uh, for losing their job 
because of their their uh, status as being pregnant. And now I think we would come to accept that women can do multiple things. They can multitask. They can be good parents. They can uh, be good, be effective wives, homemakers, if that be their desire, and also have children and hold a job down. So we'll shift to the topic of the Equal Rights Amendment, because this becomes a really big deal in the Carter administration. Again, it does not begin in the Carter administration. This is something that... I guess really gained steam in the Nixon administration, continues into the Ford administration, and then comes to the forefront um, uh, in Carter's time in office. Again, I mentioned that relay from Seneca Falls, New York to Houston. We see that in action here in this primary source. We see some young people loading into a station wagon. Uh, looks like one of those cool old wagons that had the benches in the back. I <laughs> wish they could bring this back. <laughs> uh, but raising awareness for this topic they feel very strongly about, uh, being civically engaged in our democracy. I think that's uh, the historical evidence that we see happening in this photograph. So here is the Equal Rights Amendment. You know, I think it's interesting that sometimes we think some of these big groundbreaking or benchmark uh, moments in history, uh, and we think about them in terms of, in writing, expect them to be some colossal, monumental, huge volume of work, and oftentimes they aren't. They're, sometimes they're just a couple of sentences, just like we see here. Uh, so the amendment itself is under article there, those three sections. Uh, Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. The Congress shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article, this amendment shall take effect two years after the date of ratification. So really, the amendment itself is just that section one, that simple, uh, that no rights shall be denied on account of sex. Uh, now, the controversy with passage of the amendment falls with that paragraph above. Uh, so we see that here in, um, on paper in writing. This is what Congress sees. When it goes to the states, that paragraph resolved by the Senate and House uh, representatives of the United States, that is not included on what state legislatures are voting on. That, so that creates a little bit of controversy in the passage of this amendment. So just a refresher for what it takes to get a constitutional amendment passed. Um, not sure if we'll see one of these. <laughs> happen in our lifetime, uh, given these uh, stringent requirements, but I guess our forefathers and their wisdom really wanted to make sure a good number of us were on board with any changes uh, to the document that they created to govern our nation. So let's see, first off, proposal must be passed by two-thirds majority in both houses of Congress, uh, which we all know it, I think we could look at our recent uh, debt limit deal that was just signed into law by President Biden. Uh, it's tough to get two thirds vote on, on a lot of stuff, uh, maybe anything <laughs> in Congress today. There is an alternative to that, that two thirds of the states hold a convention and approve a proposal. Maybe that could be a more viable pathway if a, if uh, I think an amendment is ever to uh, be made to our constitution going forward. And so, and after that is done, then you need three fourths, 38 of the 50 states to ratify this. And that means in uh, most, typically we all have bicameral legislatures in our states uh, in both houses of that. So this is no easy task and i think it's only become more difficult as our nation has grown that large number round number of 50 states um, as the nation gets more diverse maybe it's a little tougher to get things passed thing and, and get that many people on the same page but that's what we were up against uh, with this amendment to the constitution any amendment to the constitution so article five is the part of the Constitution that addresses amendments. It is very vague language there. 
It makes no mention uh, of ratification deadlines or a process to impose one. However, the Supreme Court decides in 1921 uh, with the case Dillon versus Gloss that Congress has this power. That was the first time that Congress does include a time limit in the uh, language of an amendment being voted on by Congress. Uh, there's nothing in Article 5 that says they can't do that. So the, I think the Supreme Court interpreted that as much like executive action. If there's not something specifically mentioned, the president can't do that. They can issue an executive order for it. Uh, so the Supreme Court interpreted this as there's nothing mentioned about deadlines. So if you want to set one, go ahead. So there is a precedent set that says Congress can do that. Although that is up for um, debate even today. So the Equal Rights Amendment contained a seven year deadlines. And this is one pa uh, passed by Congress in 1972. Um, but again, as I mentioned, when it gets sent to the states, it's always interesting, these little quirks in history, they do not include that paragraph with that seven year deadline. So a lot of folks see um, a path there for some flexibility. So Jimmy Carter is one of those people. So he ex uh, signs after Congress passes it, ex uh, a deadline extension, which extends it from March of 1979, gives it three more years uh, to June of 1982, because at this time they have 35 out of 38 states, uh, which is still pretty amazing at that point, 35 states have passed an amendment in both of their legislatures. Um, in the late 70s, um, but they still need those three more. To get to that number, they need 38. Basically, the photograph we're seeing here is a, more or less a black and white. One of that uh, first one we saw in the presentation started also from a different angle. Again, giving you a different perspective. So Carter is a very adamant, a very vocal supporter of the ERA. He's not just on the sidelines of it, kind of waiting for it to happen. Um, he, he's out there doing his part uh, to promote it uh, and support it. Here is just um, one example of a public statement uh, that President Carter puts out in support of the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, but, some, but just a couple of highlights I could point out there when we look at the last paragraph on the left, um, bringing to the forefront that it's not a novel idea. Many folks were seeing this as something coming out of the tumultuous 60s and 70s, but I think we all know just like civil rights movement, women's right movement is, it's not contained to any uh, modern period. It's something going back centuries, thousands of years. Uh, but in this instance, Carter mentions it's first introduced in 1923 when his mother is a young woman. So giving a little bit of reference there, I think, letting people know, so this has been a long struggle. Um, but I think we see the second page where it's really his personal uh, feelings about this as a husband, father, grandfather, driving at home, me as a man, these different titles of, uh, of a man that I have, you know, supports the equal rights of women, uh, amendment. Um, Emphasizing it doesn't say that we're the same. It just says that the law cannot penalize women because they are female. And that he does not believe his daughter should have fewer rights than his son. So then, you know, looking, going after people's heartstrings there. So maybe you're a man that isn't too crazy about this, but hey, we're talking about something that's going to affect your daughter if you're someone that has a male that has a daughter. So kind of a, an effective um, outreach there that we see. We also see Garton Carter referring to his time as governor of Georgia, supporting the Equal Rights Amendment, um, talking about the involvement of uh, Rosalind Carter, uh, his daughter-in-law, Judy, mentioning also, again, this is just not his idea, um, that the last six presidents have supported, uh, have been in support of an Equal Rights Amendment. Um, so, you know, I think he's you know, showing that, tr again, as I mentioned, the Carter administration trying to make this a mainstream um, acceptance that something we can just take for granted, that men and women are equal, something that doesn't need to be debated, trying to take the controversy out of it. 
And that's something, you know, that's not prescribed in the Constitution, how a president personally um, addresses an issue such as this. It's all about the person that you put in that office. And Carter here, I think, is showing his colors as far as this issue goes. So, you know, really uh, making himself vulnerable here. As mentioned, his wife, Rosalind, supports this. Other first ladies, um, we see Lady Bird Johnson. No, I'm sorry, that's um, Betty Ford uh, back there, uh, openly supporting the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, Rosalind Carter uh, would make numerous public speeches, um, lend her time to numerous fundraisers, press conferences, uh, hosted uh, countless women's organizations at the White House, she herself lobbies. Uh, legislatures at the federal, uh, I'm sorry, at the state level uh, after it passes Congress. Uh, she even participates in White House strategy sessions to help organize campaigns in unratified states. A uh, good reminder that there is absolutely nothing whatsoever in the Constitution about the role of the first lady or the partner of the president. Each one gets to make it their own. Um, I think Rosalind Carter was. Um, one of those first ladies that did not just want to be hosting tea parties, uh, talking about the Rose Garden or baking cookies. I think maybe, I think that was a first lady at the time, Hillary Clinton maybe said that I'm not just going to bake chocolate chip cookies. Uh, she was very vocal, um, was a regular participant in President Carter's cabinet meetings. We do have uh, numerous photographs in our collection of Rosalind Carter there with her husband, Secretary of State, and National Security Advisor, Vice President, and there's the First Lady in the same room. Uh, so she definitely did not shy away from this issue, along with others that she supported, like mental health uh, and support for caregivers in the country. Uh, but I don't want to give a completely one-sided um, presentation here on the ERA because we it does not pass, and that's because there was a, a lot of folks in our country that did not support it. Uh, we can see this person on the right side here working for the Stop ERA organization. You can see that passion in their face that they are very much against this. A lot of women did feel that uh, it could potentially threaten rights that they did have and had worked uh, to secure mostly at the state level and through federal uh, legislation. Um, and they thought it could potentially go away if there is something in the Constitution saying women and men are unequivocally equal. Uh, we have a letter on the left from Phyllis Schlafly. Uh, this is during, uh, not during the Carter administration, but giving you some insight um, in, into the reasons why there were women at the forefront of opposing the Equal Rights Amendment. We see this letter, uh, getting to the meat of it, uh, that she says, I have a daughter who will be 18 years old in a couple of years. Will you please tell me how you can assure her that her personal liberties uh, not to be required to register for the draft, which are presently guaranteed under the Selective Service Law, will not be abridged by ERA. Uh, so there's a couple good points there. Um, the Selective Service Law, so to point out, it is a law, it's something legislated. Uh, so in fairness, to balance that argument, um, if Congress agrees and the president signs it, they can modify that at any time they want and say that women have to be in the draft. However, if the Equal Rights Amendment is ratified, uh, they, that might be out of their hands and it could be a challenge put forth that would mandate it outside the authority of Congress to include women in the draft. So there are some legitimate fears there. Um, and we just see one example of that here. Other examples, um, labor law protections that they had at the time could be questioned. Uh, women typically um, received alimony uh, during separation and after divorce. They believe that would be jeopardized if they're equal. Then maybe someone who had, a woman who had been a homemaker her life and did not have professional working experience all of a sudden would be told you don't get alimony because you should just be getting a job like your husband. And, uh, has but then again, if she's got children, there are they gonna, you know, <laughs> would, would she be hired? Um, thanks to Jimmy Carr's Pendency Discrimination Act, maybe she would, but again, there's that fear how am I gonna get a job if I've just been a homemaker? Um, maybe I'm not gonna get that alimony. 
Uh, also, again, when we talk about separation and divorce, there was the tendency for women to win custody of children in divorce cases. And that was something they believed uh, could be jeopardized if an equal rights amendment law was passed, uh, that, that maybe that would be more complicated deliberation to determine that with them potentially on the losing side of it. Uh, so there, there are legitimate arguments um, and fears that factor into opposition, particularly that from women against the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, through it all, Jimmy Carter uh, remains an ardent supporter of it, um, despite the uh, uphill battle that they're facing in that three-year extension to get those uh, last three states, because you know this really becomes complicated as you know we have more elections and legislatures. Uh, switch hands and parties and new members come in with new priorities. Uh, but here we have a paragraph from President Carter. Uh, we've got to divide up the responsibility. We've got to organize our own forces effectively. We've got to share information. We've got to put aside the inclination that we all have to find a scapegoat on which to blame a temporary setback. We've got to share information about progress and we need never to be deterred. Our course is a proper one, our time is right, and I predict that next year we will win. I'm determined to do so if you'll help me. So he's very, very optimistic about getting this passed. So here is a map showing you just how complex uh, ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment of 1972 was. So the all those green states, those are states that ratified, that's the 35 states, both houses. We look at the 11 states, a good chunk of them in the Southeast, Utah, as well as Utah and Arizona, not ratified in either house of the state's le state legislatures. Those are uh, six solid no's. Then we look at five states in light blue, also primarily in the uh, Southeast, um, only passed in one legislature. Um, of their of their state. So it didn't make it to the finish line getting passed in both. Then we look at the four in the uh, burgundy and the red colors there. Ratified, then revoked before the 1982 deadline. Nothing in that Article 5 of the Constitution that says states can't change their minds about ratifying an amendment. Also, nothing saying that you can do, change your mind, also that you can't. So again, one of these constitutional debates that we have. Further complicating that, if we go back to that Glass versus Dillon case where the Supreme Court says, well, there's nothing that says Congress can't set a deadline, so I guess they can set a deadline. Well, these were states that did not recognize that as a valid argument. So Nevada, Illinois, and Virginia, they go ahead and ratify after the deadline because they do not recognize its validity. And then one lone purple state, North Dakota, kind of taking uh, from the argument of Nevada, Illinois, and Virginia, they had ratified it, but revoked it after the 1982 deadline. Uh, so that it's really a mixed bag of results here. Um, but ultimately, uh, the bottom line was they do not get to a clear cut 38 states amidst all these complexities at that 1982 deadline. That seems to be what is recognized um, by the Supreme Court uh, up to today. So really not cut and dry and definitely not um, a lot of shades of gray, so to speak in this ratification process. I think because of the vague language of Article 5 in the Constitution. But then again, we go back in history, it's vague language that sometimes gets us to the finish line and maybe we figure those things out uh, later. <laughs> Just seems to be what the forefathers intent was. <laughs> so here's a question for everyone. Are state or federal laws an adequate substitute for a constitutional amendment. What do you see as the advantages and disadvantages of each option? So if anybody wants to get into our chat, we'll give you a minute there 
Do you want to address any part of that? If you want to talk about the state laws, benefits, disadvantages, or the federal laws, um, or arguing on a, why a constitutional amendment, something like this maybe is the ultimate solution, feel free and judgment-free zone. This is people's opinion. It's what you think. There's no right or wrong answers here. Just looking for some engagement. So go ahead and uh, put your thoughts in our chat. I'll give you a minute there. I'm actually able to pull up the chat there, Robert. I see state and federal laws are easier to revoke or can be found unconstitutional. Great point. And if there's a law in one state, I guess not, not might not be valid in the next state that you go to. See, Patricia's point out laws can be overturned, Roe versus Wade, right? Even or even once a con a, the Supreme Court has ruled on something, that can be. You know, these can be overturned, depending on the makeup of our court, depending on uh, what parties we elect to power. Let's see, Terry Jones says, as stated, there's a low chance of everyone being on the same page. This federal law appears better. Maybe that's the strategy for our time with, with you know, increased polarization. Again, thinking about first having to get two thirds vote in both the House and the Senate. Um, which, you know, that's, we barely get the 60 votes in the Senate on most things. Uh, that's a tough hill to climb before you have to get 38 out of 50 states. So maybe federal legislation is a valid path um, or you know, could call it a stopgap solution possibly or state laws. Inconsistencies from one state to the next can make travel and work really difficult, right? We have labor laws in one state that don't apply in the next, just like any law. All right, so it does maybe give us a complex hodgepodge of, of rights when we think about, uh, especially when we think about state laws. I mean, federal laws can kind of function like a temporary amendment, so to speak, but again, as we've mentioned, they can be overturned, they can be changed, they can be modified. Supreme Court can jump in and nullify. So yeah, I think you know constitutional amendments might be the most secure way to ensure a right uh, is enshrined and respected, but probably the most difficult to get to. All right, thank you very much for joining the chat, there, folks. I really appreciate that. It's nice uh, not doing all the talking. <laughs> okay, so let's see. So 1980. So now Carter is no longer a candidate talking about what he would do. He now is an incumbent. Who's being, uh, who is in the position of having to defend their record about what they have done and still talk about what they would do in a second term, things they haven't gotten around to. I know Jimmy Carter definitely had a lot of uh, plans for the 80s that he doesn't get to see to come to fruition. Uh, but this poster we see on the right from the Carter Library collection, I think if, for, uh, if you're trying to reach female voters, that might be a really strong piece uh, of evidence showing them that you are uh, advocating on their behalf. We see this poster of presidential, of females appointed in the Carter administration. Uh, one notable one I can point out, if you go up from the bottom three rows and four to the left, so third from the bottom, fourth to the left, we see someone, Hillary Rodham. So that would be future first lady, secretary of state, uh, President, uh, United States Senator uh, and major party presidential candidate Hillary Rodham Clinton does get a job in the Carter administration. Okay, so here are some figures uh, from the Carter administration. We see from uh, talking about women in public offices, a fact sheet that the Carter administration has pointed out. Again, I would encourage anybody after the program, feel free to try to cross reference these because, again, you do want to take everything with a little grain of bias. This is something from the Carters advocating on behalf of Jimmy Carter in the 1980 election. Uh, but you do see some, according to these statistics, some uh, important developments. Uh, again, federal judiciary was probably the place Carter had the biggest impact. Um, let's see, 
four women in court of appeals judges out of 97, 14 women district court judges out of 417 um, state legislatures. So we do see participation, not just at the federal level, but we see it more so at the local and state levels. Uh, I mean, I think this is a big tangible figure here, how uh, maybe this, these, you know, national issue of the Equal Rights Amendment maybe trickles down. Uh, we see involvement of women in state legislatures increasing, more than doubling from uh, uh, 305 or 4.1 percent uh, to 767, 10.3 percent in 1979. So in that decade alone, women involved in their state government and the members of their state legislatures more than doubled in that time. Uh, statewide elective and cabinet offices, uh, let's see, increased. This is within, more or less within the Carter, across the Ford and Carter administrations from 10.3% to 10.7%. Let's see, we have a few more here. Uh, let's see, again, local office. So again, national issues having that impact at, at the most local level. Uh, 1977, 9,930 women posed 7.8 percent of fishes at the local level, uh, compared to 5,931 in 1975. So just in, in that three-year window, there uh, almost doubling the number of women in local offices. Um, again, at the Carter administration, so Ford had 12 percent of women of his administration were f were females. Carter administration uh, inverts that number, makes it 21 percent. Um, so that's a three quarters increase. Uh, so that's a very substantial uh, thing to run on in terms of women's rights. Um, and the ca again, Carter administration was the first to have two uh, female cabinet members at one time. It was one of the Cripps and Patricia Harris. And again, worth repeating, Patricia Harris is appointed to a second cabinet post uh, during the Carter administration. Again, overall, we just look at office holders at the local, state, and federal level, more or less the number is doubled um, between 1975 and May of 1979, so within that time of the Carter administration. So there's definitely a tangible record uh, to run on that Carter can you know, either directly or indirectly connect himself to when he's running for re-election in 1980. And so he, we think back to the Fordsy campaign button and Carter was really going more of that pop culture route, which was kind of balanced with a man of the earth where there were a lot of commercials of him, you know, on the farm in Georgia. Um, so now in 1980, things have you know, gotten a little more progressive. We really see uh, targeted campaigning materials uh, um, targeted specifically at women trying to carry that because they know in the last election that women made up the majority of voters and that he uh, got 52% of their votes. Uh, so if he's gonna win, it's gonna be with women. So I'll go ahead and play these two commercials just to give you an idea of how that strategy maybe had shifted, how we could see women coming more into focus in the reelection campaign. First one, we've got a familiar face for many folks, uh, old Mary Tyler Moore. And we'll get our retro uh, countdown <laughs> into both of these videos. I'm Mary Tyler Moore, and I'm here to talk to women for a minute. Uh, but men are more than welcome to listen to. And please don't take my advice just because I'm a familiar face. This is something you'll have to think out for yourself. President Carter's attitude toward the women of America is clear and constructive and forward-looking and his attitude is reflected in action. He's appointed more women to high-level jobs than any president in history. He's been consistently in favor of any legislation that would give women equal rights. Nearly half this country's women now work outside their homes, as I do. In fact, we've become a nation of two-job families. And President Carter wants our women to be able to cut through the years of disdain and delay to get the guarantees in the home and in the world that they need. This isn't a one-issue election, of course. But men and women truly concerned about women's freedom are going to vote for President Jimmy Carter. I know I am. Join Mary Tyler Moore in re-electing President Carter. 
Okay, we'll play another one here. I, this one is aimed at working mothers, as Mary Tyler Moore mentioned, uh, a lot of two job households. Uh, these days, I think we know that number can be a lot more than two. Sometimes we've got three, four, five job households these days. Uh, but here's one specifically targeting uh, working women. There are more and more women who are in the same position that I am in, and I think it's very important that a woman be able to support her family because it's happening more every day, that that's a uh, necessity. Carol Quick is one of 26 million American women for whom work is a necessity. Well, I don't see myself as a militant at all. <laughs> I just see myself as a um, supporter of my family. I think that President Carter has definitely made an awareness of women for the nation. And he's done many things that I feel are for working women. Good one. I mean, a lot of women are married and work and are contributing to their family. And I think they deserve equal rights as well. Yeah. This is why I support President Carter, because I personally feel like he supports me. That was really kind of a loaded ad there. Um, I mean, my interpretation is I, I, I think this is maybe a single working mother because um, we see her not just at the job, but we see her covering all the bases at home as well. Um, I think especially out there playing baseball with her son, something I think uh, in 1980, we, you know, stereotypically we would think, you know, that's going to be the father playing catch with the kid and playing baseball, all of that. Uh, also mentioning I'm not a militant. Again, you know, I think the women's right movement, um, you know, got associated with a lot of things that it may or may not have been. I mean, people maybe saw it as a gateway to communism, as a gateway to gay rights at the time, which um, I think America was, you know, definitely still coming to terms with then, which from, if we look at our headlines today, maybe coming to terms still today. Uh, so it's really, a, a, I think, a progressive um, ad that we have there. So we definitely see a campaign shift from the Carter uh, campaign from 1976 uh, to 1980. But again, really trying to uh, you know, secure that critical voting block uh, that got him into the White House to begin with. So the Carter, I mean, uh, for better or for worse, they definitely are being responsive um, uh, to their stakeholders. Okay, so here is an excerpt from what was called the record of Jimmy Carter. Again, this is something that was produced by the Carter administration. Again, so take it with a grain of bias here. I uh, highly encourage folks to look for other perspectives or, or other sources that can support and cross-reference uh, what you see here. Uh, but when we look at their work with equal rights and protections, again, that extension for three years of the ERA, they put that right at the top. Um, let's see, when we think about let's see, senior management, appointment of more Blacks, Hispanics, and women to cabinet, sub cabinet, White House, and other senior management positions than any other president, judgeships, appointment of more Blacks, Hispanics, and women, all previous 38 presidents combined. Again, that's, I think, a really huge uh, point to run on there. Uh, minority businesses, tripling of federal purchases. So here's a concluding discussion because we are at three o'clock here. Um, this is a question I ask students. Again, there's no right or wrong answers. Um, you know, I'm not looking for one perspective or the other here, though I might offer uh, a question, <laughs> a subsequent question. Uh, do you think it is important for the people serving in our government to reflect our nation's diversity, whether that be age, sex, um, ethnicity, um, skin color, why or why not? So let's go to our chat. This is what we're going to close out our program with here today, just to get some dialogue going with everybody, see what's on people's minds. Again, no right or wrong answers here. This is what we think. It's what history is all about, interpreting the primary sources that we see. 
Let's see, Patricia says it's important to have all perspectives included in the discussion. I think that's a valid point. Maybe if those people that are affected by certain issues and topics are, we see them in government, maybe if you identify with them, you feel better about decisions being made. So Terry Jones says, of course, without those perspectives at the table, we are not represented. See, there cannot be a government of the people unless that government is fully reflective and representing of the people. So I guess coming full circle, that e pluribus unum, if we want to out of, be out of many one, we need to have those many <laughs> in our one government. And maybe that's the argument that's being made here. So here, here's my sub, this is a question I throw to students. And again, this isn't me being for or against. What I ask them is, so if that's true, what, are we, what about old white Jimmy Carter? The man, man, male Jimmy Carter, who came into the White House in 1977, had this huge impact on gender equality, uh, not just in the government, but in our nation. What is a retort to that when a white male comes in and has a significant impact and a change? that we wanna see, but he necessarily isn't that, that demographic. And when, you know, this can be on a lot of different issues. And I think it's important to you know, look at the other side of the conversation. So is there anyone who could address that? It's okay, I know that, that's, that's a limb to go out on. <laughs> So you can argue that he helped, oh, let's see, my thing went up a little bit, let me see. You can argue that he helped pave the way for those to come. At the time, there was no way a woman or person of color could be elected. Yeah, people had tried. It, it definitely wasn't up, it's an uphill battle for a lot of old white men at that time, let alone a woman or someone of color. They, they had tried. Let's see, a white male hired me. Only he was willing to bring women into the picture where I worked. So, Terry's showing that you know she had somebody in her life, a personal experience where it wasn't a woman that made the things happen, it was a man. Well, yeah, he also wasn't exactly all the time. <laughs> My apologies for, maybe I was being a little ageist there. My apologies for that. Yeah, Jimmy Carter would have been 53, I believe, when he assumed the presidency, so he's middle-aged. I guess I'm used to framing that because I'm usually talking to school kids. <laughs> it's 53, definitely feels old for, for that demographic. Okay, oh, Terry's a woman. Good, thanks for letting us know that, Terry. Sorry if I spoke out of turn there. So what do you think, Joshua? Did you uh, address most of the uh, comments and questions in the chat? I think, yeah, I think so. You know, and I think, like, like our folks are saying there, that maybe you don't have to be that person. Um, but something tells me Jimmy Carter wouldn't have been as worried about these if he didn't have those people in his administration, um, if he wasn't paying attention to the pulse of the nation. So, you know, I think it, it goes both ways that um, because of people being civically engaged, it got that person to change. So it wasn't, I think the change that Jimmy Carter made, they weren't uh, all self-initiated, I guess you could say, that they were motivated by women being uh, politically engaged. Um, but yes, as I said, you know, we want to balance the uh, conversation here and, you know, address some of these tough, tough issues. Because, you know, that's what we hear when we hear opposition to it. You know, it's not necessary because, you know, a white man can white president can get this done and federal laws can address this and that. So I think it's important to have these conversations and really see what uh, people who agree with us are saying, and more importantly, what people who disagree with us mm -hmm. say about issues. Uh, so I really want to thank everyone who took time to participate and put their thoughts out there. And that's definitely not easy these days. We do have uh, tougher times having civil discourse, but I'm so glad that we could have it here today. So thank all of you for that.
Yeah, so folks, let's give uh, Joshua a big virtual round of applause for uh, for educating us this afternoon and for making us think. And thank you for asking some uh, some consequen cons consequential questions. Say that five times fast. Uh, uh, folks, I look for an email from me tomorrow with a link to this recording, a link to a feedback survey. Uh, also, uh, I will share the slides uh, when Joshua gets those to me. And um, there'll also be information about some other upcoming uh, virtual uh, visits with presidential libraries. So very much looking forward to those. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Joshua. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Yeah, you too, Joshua. Thanks so much. Okay.